Well, hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. And with these interviews, I try to bring you behind the scenes to talk to the researchers who are actually doing the work that all of this news that we report on is based on. And so today, I'm honored to be joined by Celeste Keith. Celeste, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. So, so who are you? What do you do? Um, my name is Celeste, like you said. I'm a fourth year graduate student at the University of Chicago. Um, my background is in uh, math, physics, and astronomy. Um, I did my undergraduate research or degree at University of Wisconsin Madison. And right now I'm kind of specializing in high energy particle physics and primordial black holes. And so, fourth year graduate student, so you haven't got your doctorate yet, but you're really close. About one year. I'm in about about this time next year, I should have it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and so are, so is the research that you're working on right now? Is that going to turn into your final dissertation your and your defense? Or yeah, that... basically, um, especially in theory circles, usually, you don't necessarily have to write this big four year um, paper when you finish your uh, PhD, you can kind of basically like staple your papers together at the end. Um, you know, maybe maybe collate them in some way. But um, yeah, everything I'm working on right now, I will definitely be talking about in my thesis defense. It's, it's really interesting, because like, when you talk to people who are at that phase, like, you are like, when you're in your the PhD zone, you are specializing to the point that you are now chart, you know, uncovering new things, adding to humanity's understanding of science in ways that nobody have ever done. The whole point of you getting your doctorate is that you now know something that nobody else knows. Yeah, you, you, you do something special. You know, I can't go and look up answers in textbooks anymore online. Like right. I am creating the answers. Um, yeah. I didn't really notice it was happening and until it suddenly was. Um, and it's really cool. Yeah, really that's cool. great. Now you sort of came to my attention, you published a paper uh, just within the last couple of weeks about your thinking on primordial mass black holes. And I get a ton of questions about primordial black holes here on the channel. And so I thought, let's bring in an expert. And let's, uh, let's cover this topic from top to bottom. So uh, I'm not gonna say what is a black hole, because obviously, we know what a black hole is. So what is a primordial black hole? Okay, so maybe your audience knows a black hole, the, the ones we think of usually collapsing star, or whatever, a primordial black hole is not from a collapsing star. So the reason it's called primordial is because it's formed in very, very early universe. So we're talking like, potentially first seconds, first 10 minutes, first, you know, little bit of time there. Um, and so that's why it's primordial there early. And um, they aren't necessarily the same mass as you would get from a collapsing star. So primordial black holes, have been theorized to possibly be, or people have been searching for primordial black holes that are many, many, many solar masses uh, down to asteroid mass, which is the ones I'm looking at, all the way down to very small black holes that evaporate in minutes or tens of minutes. Um, and so it's a wide range because primordial black holes can be formed at a wide range of masses. Um, and I guess I should say how we think maybe they're formed. Um, I'm not two in the weeds on how they're formed, but I, the, the idea is that there are density fluctuations in the early universe, and some of those get to be so large that light can't escape from them. So it's not from a collapsing star, it's just that this density fluctuation is so big that it forms its own black hole, and that can be many sizes, many different masses, uh, or sizes, I guess, is probably a better yeah. way to say it because they aren't made of you know mass the way we think of it. Um, yeah. And, and so, so like, just so if I understand this right, like, in the early universe, when within the first, say, as you say, 10 minutes, when just some of the basic fundamental forces of the universe were still getting their start, mm -hmm. you, the, the, the universe was this sort of soup of elementary particles, but it's possible that it had over densities and under densities to the point that black holes could just form right in place without all that pesky having to have a star go supernova all that in between stuff you just boom pop black exactly. hole exactly it's really nuts but yes exactly and and i guess like can we rule out i mean i guess because this theory exists right now does the math about the early universe 
tell us anything about how possible these things are? That is a really good question. And the first paper I did on primordial black holes actually did that. They were, we were looking at the time of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So that's when um, all the, the elements were forming, or at least hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium, because um, I alluded to earlier, the black holes evaporate. And if you have too many black holes in that time, if we add in too many into our theories, black holes evaporating are going to produce energetic particles that can blast those nuclei apart. And so it could slow down BBN. We could have mm. a lot less or a lot fewer um, helium because there's all these energetic particles coming and blasting apart that nuclei. And we know now what the helium fraction is in the universe. So we know how much hydrogen there is approximately, how much helium, how much lithium. And so if you have your theory putting in too many black holes in the early universe, it's going to mess up those ratios. And we know what the ratios are supposed to be. So that puts constraints on these black holes in the early universe. Um, but that would really only be affected by black holes that are small enough to evaporate quickly enough to make energetic particles, particles that are energetic enough to blast apart those nuclei. So that puts constraints right. on really, really low mass black holes. And so that would be like uh, that idea of, of Hawking radiation, that they would be appearing and then they would just be evaporating so quickly and they'd give that blast of gamma radiation that would that would cause uh, damage to their <laughs> surroundings. And that <laughs> that could possibly be detectable in sort of the way the universe unfolded from this point on. But I mean, yeah. the other question that I get a lot is like, why didn't the whole universe just collapse into a black hole? Um, and so we didn't get a, an observable universe's worth of black hole. Mm -hmm. And so why would there be some kind of in between where you get some but not one? Um, there are I mean, we can have other massive black holes also because um, Black holes, if you increase the mass of a black hole by a factor of 10, it's going to take 10,000 extra years to evaporate. So that's uh, four orders of magnitude. So if you increase the mass of those black holes just a little bit in the early universe, they can exist and not mess up um, BBN, not mess up the formation of the light elements. Um, so those were the kind of black holes we were looking at. And also we can have just only a small, small, small fraction of these things exist. Um, so turning down the number of black holes will prevent some of this damage to the universe or turning up the mass so they aren't evaporating at the same time that all the light elements are trying to form. Right, right. And so, okay, so, so let's say we did have those over densities, under densities that was able to form this collection of black holes at, at a variety of, of masses. What would the mass distribution of these primordial black holes be like across the universe today? That is a good question because it is debated. Um, we, a lot of this topic is trying to figure out if primordial black holes, one, even exist, and two, what mass range they might be in, because they could span the entire mass range. So that's why we need to use many different uh, ideas in order to put constraints on the mass of these black holes. So I was just talking about BBN can put constraints on really, really low mass black holes, um, microlensing can put constraints on black holes, primordial black holes that are between about 10 to the 21, 22 grams and above. Um, the CMB can put constraints on really, really high mass primordial black holes, because if those existed, um, we would see them in the CMB because those black holes would be massive enough to actually change the density of the CMB or like the, you know, the plane of the CMB. Um, and in my case, we're looking at the gamma ray, my, my most recent paper, the gamma ray emission from the galaxy and putting constraints on black holes that way. So they're, depending upon what mass range you want to look at for these primary black holes, whether they're really, really low mass or really, really high mass, you have to use a different tool in order to be able right. to constrain how many could actually be there based on what we see in real life. Okay, how many black holes could possibly exist while still seeing that thing? in the sky or in the CMB that we uh, know exists. So we have to fit it into what we see, which is kind of good because that allows us to put constraints on the primordial black holes. Well, let's talk about those methods for for trying to detect them. You you quickly went through four, I counted four, I think, ways to try and get a sense if these things are out there. I'd love to slow down and and look at each each one of these. Um, we'll, we'll do your research last. And, okay. and we'll go with we'll go with the other ones. So let's, let's talk about this idea of of micro lensing. How would how would that work? Okay, so micro lensing, um, 
you might be familiar with lensing. It's kind of the same thing, except on a much smaller scale. So if you have a star in the background and a uh, object comes in front of that star, that star's light curve or its brightness will increase by just a little bit and then come back down. And that's called microlensing because it's on a really small scale. It tends to be in our galaxy that we look for these things um, because we can't necessarily resolve a lot of stars from other galaxies. But when we think about it, what could go in front of a star to make it get brighter for a little bit of time and then you know, dimmer, you know, passing in front and a primordial black hole within that sort of mass range. Um, I, th I think about like 10 to the 21, 10 to the 22 grams and above could do that. Um, black holes smaller, it's gonna, you're not gonna be able to detect that brightening right. as much, so we can't use it there. Um, and so there have been surveys looking for these, this brightening. Um, when I was a junior in college, I worked at Fermilab on a project about microlensing. So that's where I have most of my knowledge from. We were using dark energy survey, DES, to look for microlensing in the DES survey. And I think I would have heard about it if we had some really exciting discovery of some weird object going in front of uh, a star and brightening it for a short amount of time. But I yeah. don't think on that but that doesn't mean we can rule it out really we just keep pushing down the total amount of black holes there can possibly be um because yeah we're not trying to say this is impossible we're just trying to rule out more and more parameter space yeah but i think there have been a couple of detections in in either in the milky way or in other galaxies but not like dark matter explanation levels of <laughs> primordial black holes just that okay there are black holes out there with various masses that are passing in front of stars and and those constraints are still are still coming down. So you've got these these situations where these these rogue black holes and that's sort of a chilling idea are roaming about inside the galaxy left over from the Big Bang, um, moving around and in theory, you're seeing these winks of light as the black holes pass in front. Mm -hmm. How could we see them in the cosmic microwave background? So now we're talking about black holes that are much more massive than just roaming black holes. So these are probably ooh, stellar mass around. Um, these, and probably even larger, they would be big enough to, okay, let's, I'll take a step back. The CMB map that as, as we see is a map of the densities and over densities in the early universe. So this is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, and we can detect one part in 10 to the minus five or one part in 10 to the five density perturbations, which is really, really precise. That's a uh, hundred thousand, I think. Um, and so if you put a bunch of this extra mass into the universe at the time that the CMB is being formed and it's mass, so it is dense, we might be able to see it in the CMB hmm. because the black holes would create an overdensity where they are. Um, if there were enough of them, if they were massive enough, because again, it's it's hard to rule them completely out, but we can say that, oh, oh, this experiment says that there can't be more than this many. And this experiment says that there has to be fewer than that and fewer than that. Um, and so when you have black holes that massive, it can actually affect the CMB because the black holes existed at the time that the CMB was being created. Um, and so we can use the CMB to put constraints on the uh, primordial black holes in the universe. But the, I mean, you mentioned like maybe you could see them stellar mass black holes and above, but one of the big mysteries in astronomy right now is how did supermassive black holes form so early after the Big Bang? We see them even in galaxies as they were less than a billion years after the Big Bang, which is kind of surprisingly quickly for these black holes to merge, emerge, emerge to get to the size. You would think that a black hole of that kind of mass would be even more detectable in the cosmic microwave right. background, or are they almost and, too big to detect? And we don't see. I'm actually quick looked at um, one of the plots, and we're talking 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 10 solar masses um, that get ruled out by the CMB. So oh, um, okay, it's, they're 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 quite large. Um, so, so yeah. this, so that cutoff has already been made that astronomers have already looked at the CMB and ruled out stuff yes. that is 10 to the five, 10 to the 10. So like yes. 10,000 I mean, times the mass of the sun to a billion right. times the mass of the sun. You could have a small number of them based on the constraints, but the constraints over there, the CMB really helps us constrain that. Cause you, you would see those, the effects of those black holes on the CMB because but, they're so mad, but not like the weird 
like not the two trillion one mm -hmm. per galaxy that mm -hmm. that we yeah, see that out there. Uh, it's a mystery to me. I think it's, um, you know, how did we get go from solar mass black holes from when stars explode to supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, which we know exist as well. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure how that happened. They could have been primordial black holes. There's also um, black holes can merge and build up and get more and more massive. So that could have happened as well. Um, but I think it's still kind of a mystery right now. You Pacific. mentioned a, a third way, and I actually forget the term you used. Yes. So um, this is for, um, are you talking about my research? Before your research, there was like another way we could de potentially detect primordial mass black holes. Was it through gravitational waves? Was that? That is a way we can detect primordial mass black holes, but that wasn't the way okay. I was yeah, specifically mentioning. So what we are doing is we are looking at the total flux from the galaxy, um, the center of the Milky Way galaxy, about the inner 20 by 20 degrees, and looking at the gamma ray, so that's high energy, um, energy range. And we are, there's, there's a, slight, a slight excess um, from the Milky Way after you take into account everything we expect to be there, everything we see is there. And so what we are trying to do is do what's called a template analysis and we first simulate a um, Milky Way that has no black holes, but has all of the other components that we expect the flux from the Milky Way to be. Like all the light, where did all the light come from? So we do the point sources, there's the extra galactic gamma ray background, um, there's flux from inverse Compton scattering, uh, pi knot production, Bremsstrahlung radiation, um, and probably some other things I'm forgetting. Uh, we also include a dark matter particle that is not black holes because in all of this research, it's important to say, I don't think there is much, we don't think all of the dark matter could be black holes, mostly. Um, we're saying it could be a sub component because we don't know much about dark matter. So it could be one thing, it could be a mixture of things. So we are just trying to see it, how much of the total amount of dark matter could possibly be black holes. So one of the components we put in the galaxy is a uh, particle. Mm -hmm. It's not really important, the specifics, but it's about a 40 GeV particle. It's annihilating to um, BB bars, so that's bottom quark, anti-bottom quark, and creating photons, which creates light. Um, and then we have all these things that we put together that when you put them all together, like stacking them on top of each other, it looks like the light from the Milky Way. And then we put in a black hole template that it, it kind of just, we, we kind of know what um, the black hole, or not black hole, the dark matter distribution looks like in the galaxy. Um, and we crank up the total um, amount of black holes we have. Like how, how much does this contribute to the total light? And when it starts to stop looking like what we actually see from the galaxy, we turn it off. Because we know that can't be right because we can see what we see from the galaxy. And if it starts to look wrong, um, that's not good. So. That's what we were doing. We weren't explicitly looking for a black hole, but there's going to be a new telescope um, in the next five, 10 years called E-Astrogan. And we're making projections for this telescope where when it looks at the sky, if it looks in this energy range, which we expect it will, and it sees nothing, there aren't black holes there because- Right, and, and so sorry, you, know, you mentioned this, you've got all of these, these sources of gamma radiation. Mm -hmm. What are the methods that the black hole is producing gamma radiation? Right. This is this is the coolest part. So there's a couple things that I want to talk about first. So the lighter a black hole is, the faster it's going to produce particles and the more energetic those particles are going to be. Um, so if you have a really, really small black hole, it can make all sorts of particles. Um, in the standard model and all, every particle that exists, even the ones we don't know about, it will make. Um, and if you have a super heavy black hole, it really can only make light particles. So photons, neutrinos, electrons, stuff like that. So we're looking at a range between about one times 10 to the 15 grams and one times 10 to the 17 grams. So this is asteroid mass approximately. Um, and just for reference, a black hole that's about four times 10 to the 14 grams that was made at the very beginning of the universe would finish evaporating today. Right. Like right now it takes about 13.6 billion years. So, so these low mass black holes, thanks to Hawking radiation, their evaporation, 
the smaller they get, the more they run out of mass, the closer they get to just disappearing, they're mm -hmm. producing more and more interesting, bigger, heavier, weirder particles until they vaporize completely and then you get that final burst of, of gamma radiation that's really interesting i didn't know that 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 the more massive they are when you start with the supermassive one it's just plain old photons but as they yeah, get smaller it, the, the it turns into a weird particle accelerator exactly it, it just doesn't have enough energy is the way i think of it so the lower mass black holes have a lot of energy to make these particles the higher mass black holes don't um, and that's why, partially why it takes so, so long for a heavier black hole to evaporate than a light black hole, because it starts to be able to evaporate a bunch more stuff, get rid of its energy much more uh, quickly. Um, but our black holes are, they're not going to evaporate in the universe or the time of the universe has existed, but they are producing a good amount of particles right now. Um, and I guess, Chris, right so you just mentioned that they kind of go away in a flash at the very end which is totally true that's another way we can put constraints on the existence of primordial black holes do we see a bunch of flashes in the sky like weird bright gamma ray flashes um from black holes evaporating presumably and um i think we see some flashes on occasion there's like gamma ray bursts and stuff like that but i don't think anyone has really said yes that's probably a black hole uh finishing evaporating so that can put constraints on um, the total number of black holes as well, based on how many of these weird things we see. And I'm assuming that when a black hole, just a black hole being a black hole is also going to be absorbing material from its surroundings. And that is a source of gamma radiation as material is just being consumed by the black hole itself. Well, we are, these black holes would be too small to really have that be, make a difference. Um, an asteroid sized black hole isn't very big. It doesn't have a very big event horizon. The odds that it's going to be ingesting enough stuff in order to keep it from losing mass um, is pretty low. So I don't think that's, that's, that is definitely something that happens, especially with higher mass black holes. But with the black holes we're worried about, that doesn't really happen. So, and so this, like, what is the least massive possible primordial black hole that could still be alive today, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang? It's going to be, oh, it would be pretty, it would be evaporating right now. So it would be really, really, really small. Um, like asteroid the, mass. Yeah, yeah. Those, those are going to be, and they would still take a while to evaporate now, um, but potentially could be evaporating within our lifetime. Um, so that's why we're starting at 10 to the 15 approximately grams. Um, and the ones that are evaporating right now would be 10 to the 14 uh, grams. And so then if you took this model that you've created and you uh, compared this to the images of the Milky Way that you, that you see, mm -hmm. what, would it, what would it look like? Would it be like a general diffuse glow or would it be coming from point sources? Um, it would be definitely a general diffuse glow um, based on the simulations we've been doing. Um, it would kind of look like, because dark matter, we don't think clumps like regular matter. So it kind of would be like a round um, blob with the center at the center of the Milky Way. It is slightly denser at the center of the Milky Way um, and then kind of just expand out kind of like a sphere. We did in our project, um, vary how dense it is in the center compared to the outskirts. Um, it's called, it's called gamma. There's a factor called gamma. And the more you crank that up, the more like peaky the density profile gets. Um, but it just, it's kind of like a sphere uh, around the center of the Milky Way. So now I guess like, why do you find this concept? I mean, now you've sort of dedicated a big chunk of your research into this into this field, into a phenomenon that is purely theorized. Um, why do you find this aspect of black holes so fascinating? I think, I mean, every kid who likes astronomy grows up and hears about black holes and you're like, oh my God, that's so insane. And then you find out that they evaporate, not only how they're formed and the fact that light can't escape them, we have no idea what's going on in there and physics breaks down at the event horizon, but then they also evaporate and we're pretty sure they do. Like it's, it's hard to find a black hole and prove that it evaporates, but we're pretty darn sure that they do. Um, it was just 
fascinating. And the more, every paper I did sort of built off the last. So I had a tool set and a, and a, you know, packages that I'd written in Python that I could carry over from one project to another. And I just learned more every time I went to the next project, which helped me feel more confident, helps me be more excited about it. And black holes are just, they're just really cool. I love talking about them. I love thinking about them actually existing. Um, my previous project from this one, we were talking about how many black holes could exist to account for what's called the 511 KEV excess. There's a uh, excess of 511 keV photons coming from the center of the galaxy and um, particle physicists may know that the mass of an electron is 511 keV um, and uh, keV I, I don't really use grams and kilograms when I talk about masses um, it's just a weird particle physics thing that I've had to get used to in the past couple years but that is the mass of an electron and when an electron and a positron annihilate, they will produce two 511 keV photons. So we say, hmm, there's an excess of 511 keV photons. Where could those be coming from? Oh, there could be some black holes making uh, positrons because that's antimatter. Uh, we don't need, really need it to make electrons because there are already electrons in the uh, universe or in the galaxy, but it makes positrons that annihilate with electrons. So maybe black holes are making these positrons that can create this 511 keV excess. Um, and yeah, that was quite fun. And the, the crux of that paper was that if uh, in our range that these black holes existed, there could be one in the solar system, which right. is, is really fun. And I'm not saying there is. <laughs> yeah, um, this yeah. is just if we are right, you know, based on the how, how they might be distributed in the, in the Milky Way, there could be one in the solar system. And these aren't this isn't anything to worry about. It's it's just as long as you don't go touch it it's just like an asteroid coming through you know the, the solar system and that was just so cool and fun to tell the people and i don't know it's it's both a mixture of my enjoyment of doing the actual research and then my like childlike enjoyment of talking about the topic of black holes in the first place that you really enjoy it now you mentioned a spacecraft or or instrument that's coming up? I mean, gamma rays are tricky, right? Because you have to be outside of the Earth's atmosphere to even be able to, to observe them. So it's got to be a space telescope. So let's, let's talk about this mission and potentially any others that could help gather some concrete information. Sure. So oh, instrumentation is not necessarily my forte, but it's called e Astrogam, which is a future gamma ray telescope. Um, it stands for uh, Oh, sorry, uh, there's another telescope called AMIGO that stands for All Sky Medium Energy Gamma Ray Observatory, right. and then E Astrogam, just called Astrogam, and they're capable of detecting photons through both pair conversion and Compton scattering. So we can see um, photons in about one to 100 uh, MeV. That's a lot of power. It's very, yeah. it's very wide. Yeah, yeah there. In my paper, we think that E Astrogam, we focus on that specifically, will be able to detect, have two orders of magnitude better detection for black holes if they exist. So we can rule out two orders of magnitude more on the parameter space, which is you know, 100 times more than we have currently. So where would that constrain it then? Like, like primordial black holes have to be bigger than, I guess, the mass of a small asteroid or they would have evaporated and have to be smaller than what? Right. So I can tell you exactly based on uh, my paper. So we're in the range of about 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 18 grams. And um, E astrogam, if it now doesn't I'm like, see... I'm having to do some math here. Hold on. So that'd be 10 to the 12 kilograms. Uh, I'm trying to think what that is. That's like Earth. That's no Earth is like 24. So still in kind of asteroid range, mm -hmm. big asteroid range. Big asteroid range at one end and yeah, at the other end. Um, they could possibly make up between about 10 to the minus seven of the total dark matter in the galaxy up to at the very high mass range, about 10 to the minus four. So, so you could you could rule out, like if you actually able to make these observations, you could then rule out all primordial mass black holes above this heavy asteroid range. Or does it does it do does it still you can still have other islands of black holeness farther up the the mass scale 
Right. We're, we're ruling out within our mass range only. And then if we don't see anything above those numbers that I just cited, they're not there, basically. If, right. if yes, and so that's where we're ruling out. We're not ruling out a mass range. We're ruling out a total fraction of these black holes that could be dark matter because you can always go smaller and smaller to the fraction. You can have one black hole and be like, this is 10 to the minus 121 of the total dark matter in the galaxy. Um, so we can't say we rule anything out for sure, but the more we push that constraint down and, and say, well, if they exist, they have to be, you know, 10 to the minus 10 of the black holes or the dark matter in the galaxy, you get, you know, less and less probable that they exist or can help solve any um, currently existing astronomical problems if they do exist. So this kind of thing is, is really important because we, as astronomers, we just want to rule things out basically. So we know we're yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. We talk about this all the time that, you know, the goal of scientists is to prove themselves wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's when you can't f prove yourself wrong that you, that things get a little interesting, but mm -hmm. the expectation is that this is going to be wrong and that's going to be wrong and so on. How, how does, I guess, how do black holes work as a candidate for dark matter? How does that fit into the potential family of, of dark matter that could be out there? Yeah, they work pretty well. Um, I think they were more popular in slightly in the past um, when uh, machos and wimps were kind of the big, the big two. Um, I wouldn't say they've been ruled out. I'd say they're one of the more popular things for people to work on now. But I have so definitely been seeing a lot of papers recently. It, it's definitely building. I'm sure if you did a search on archive, mm -hmm. primordial black holes would be getting more than its share of, of papers. It's just so hard to nail down what dark matter could possibly be because there's so many options. Um, there's lots of different models. I mean, one of the things in our paper was saying, all right, we know that black holes probably aren't all of dark matter. So we had to put in a model for dark matter ourselves um, based on another really good paper that some of my colleagues wrote. But um, there are lots of those, lots of predictions on what it could be. And, you know, the more we use, you know, ground-based telescopes or space-based telescopes and we don't see any weird particles, the more it opens up the field to even more um, extreme and exotic ideas. It's, it's um, my, my advisor really likes supersymmetry, um, where you can pull out some things that could be dark matter in there, sterile neutrinos, which are super, super light compared to black holes, which are heavy. It's, it's a huge field. Um, and I don't think you'd ever find a scientist willing to say, yep, my idea is correct. Um, I know my advisor likes to give percentages on like how confident he is that this kind of thing will happen. Yeah. Um, and like, I find it really, really interesting, but I would never sit here and tell you, yep, black holes, definitely the dark matter in the galaxy. Um, I'm just saying where the black holes can't be the dark matter in the galaxy. But I, I, I feel like that that perspective is the one that is starting to take over. Like now when I ask people, like, place your bets, what do you think dark matter is? The answer is more like, well, it's probably a bunch of stuff in the same way that that the missing matter in the universe has turned out to be stars, planets, gas, mm -hmm intergalactic gas, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Like it builds up bit by bit to till you reach this, this percentage. And it could very well be that that dark matter, it's not just that it's primordial mass black holes. It's not just that it's wimps, it's not just that it's machos. It's actually bit by bit that are all together adding this this missing gravity effect mm -hmm. in the universe. And I'm really hoping we'll be able to see something more concrete in the next 10 years, five years until these missions um, go out, because we are getting much closer to these, these really, you know, exotic, low, low abundance um, parts of parameter space. And it's just really, it's really exciting. I'm optimistic that something will come out. And also primordial black holes. I, lots of people acknowledge that they probably exist or something like that probably happened in the early universe. Again, I'm not going to say this definitely happened, but it seems to be just a thing that people kind of accept happened um, mm -hmm. somehow. And we kind of work from there. So it's really only a matter of time, hopefully. Um, they may not make up a ton of the dark matter, but they probably exist in some capacity. At least that's what I think. That's what I think. There was a merger detected by the 
by LIGO a couple of years back where the two black holes that came together, their pre merger masses were shouldn't have been able to have been produced naturally. I don't know if you were familiar with that. Vaguely, that, that remind me what the masses were. Yeah, it was like 65 and I forget exactly 65 and 85 masses, but neither of them can come from pure like parent stability supernova explosions like they had to have had previous mergers beforehand, which is kind of like a weird chain of mm -hmm. events to get you to this, this merger, but a primordial mass black hole explains it perfectly, because exactly. you just you can have you can have any mass you like, starting exactly. from the universe. That would be a lot of mergers. And then those merged black holes would have to find each other. So it seems rather unlikely, rather than just two primordial black holes. Um, that that is also really exciting to me. And that's definitely a lot heavier with black holes than what I'm working with. But there's no reason to believe if primordial black holes exist at, you know, 65 solar masses that they don't also exist at, you know, a 10th of a solar mass or, or you know, much more smaller. So yeah, I think it's it's exciting. It's just the distribution of how many of these things actually exist is uh, also pretty interesting to me. Like how many are low mass, how many are medium mass, how many of these high mass ones. Now, you mentioned that you are sort of preparing your your math for existing spacecraft. They're going to be coming out in the next couple of years that you can then when it makes their observations, you can check against your predictions and, and find out. But mm -hmm. if you had a blank check, and were able to design a mission that could get an answer to this question. What would what do you think would give us sort of the best, the most effective results? I think the quickest and maybe the easiest to see would be black holes evaporating um, right now because it would just be so bright. Um, and if they exist, I mean, if black holes exist in the mass range I'm talking about, they also have to exist mm -hmm. in the lower mass mm -hmm. range, whether or not they do now or will in the future, because the black holes in our mass range exist and they will evaporate down to the smaller ones. So I would want a telescope that is really good at detecting those final flashes before the black hole evaporates completely. Um, would, would it I have a that signature that was different for like, it would it be, be really obvious that it was that it, that it was this final burst of Hawking radiation? Yeah, it would be very, very bright, um, not just from photons, but from every particle that existed. And then those those particles that it's making that aren't necessarily photons would be interacting with the interstellar medium, creating other photons because photons is what we can see. Um, we also may be able to detect the neutrinos, but that's probably secondary. But like I mentioned before, it'll create positrons that will annihilate with electrons and create more photons. So it would just be a really, really bright spot in the sky. And I would expect we might even be able to see it in the Milky Way. Um, that but, so that would be most exciting to me. But we have like telescopes like Swift, we have, a, we have a few gamma ray telescopes capable of detecting mm -hmm. gamma ray bursts. And, you know, the explanation for these gamma ray bursts seems to have been have been settled. So would these be like a different class of burst bright, but, but not gamma ray burst bright or a different period of trying try to think about how you could distinguish between dying black holes and the traditional the traditional gamma ray bursts, which we barely understand at this point. I'm not super familiar with gamma ray bursts. How long do they usually last? Because that'll help me in the order of, of like the shorts, the short ones are in the order of a few seconds and the long ones are in the order of say a minute a minute and a half. Okay, that would be very hard to distinguish then between that and a black hole. Mm. Um, at least from my intuition, they would be hard to distinguish. Um, yeah, it's, it's too bad because that, that would be the one thing that would be really obvious that I'd want to search for. Um, yeah. And then I wonder about the particles, like, mm -hmm. you know, one of the biggest mysteries still in astronomy is some of the, the highest energy cosmic radiation. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's coming from the environments around black holes. Maybe they're coming from supernovae explosions. Could they be coming from evaporating black holes? Definitely. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, 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 I'm not saying they are just that they could definitely be coming from evaporating black yeah. holes. Um, I would be cu curious to know 
kind of jogging my thoughts now, how many we see, because we could also maybe use that if, if we can say they may come from black holes, if we can use that to also put constraints on evaporating black holes. Because if we say, oh, these super uh, high energetic particles are coming from evaporating black holes, we would uh, approximately know their mass because they have to be at a certain mass in order to make particles that energetic. And then we could say, how many do we see in the sky? Okay, how many black holes does that correspond to? Yeah. Um, so that would be a really interesting thing to do. I don't know if anybody has. I don't or know if... either. Yeah. Yeah, but it is interesting that, you know, this this idea that in the last moments of, of its life, a black hole turns into the most sophisticated particle accelerator that exists well beyond anything humanity could ever build down here on, on Earth, and then it's gone and blasts out these weird heavy particles, many of which will will decay, but still, uh, they're going to be moving at, at very high energies. It's a it's a fascinating concept. Well, if people want to follow your work, keep track of what you're doing, watch as you defend in real time, uh, your your thesis, what is the best place to keep track of your work? Oh, um, I don't have a lot of social media, but I archive. Arch archive. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, I am expecting to kind of continue with the structure that I've been doing in my previous paper to look at TED halos around pulsars in my next project. Nobody scoop me. Um, and yeah, just, just on archive follow. If, if you're interested in reading papers on archive, because I know papers can be really dense, like um, just kind of hard to read, hard to get through. But if you're interested in that, you know, follow the different subfields that you're interested in and you know, keep an eye out for my next one. I Fantastic. Guess. Uh, well, uh, good luck with your getting your doctorate and uh, and congrats on on the series of papers so far. And if you do detect a primordial mass black hole, please let me know. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Good luck with your research. Thank you. This was fun.